been in a series called Churchy Words. And Churchy Words basically comes from the idea or the foundation of a concept that in church we kind of tend to speak our own language. And uh, just to kind of catch up, maybe if somebody had not been here, it's an idea. You, you know, you've probably heard uh, people uh, who are Christians talk, and sometimes even if you are a Christian, you don't know what they're talking about. We tend to use words and, and don't dive necessarily into the full meaning or the definition of them. So for this uh, eight weeks or so, we're just walking through uh, words that we, we know are so significant and meaningful, but maybe we don't have a full understanding of. And today's word is lordship. And we're going to be looking at an Old Testament narrative, uh, Joshua chapter 5. If you want to go and turn to uh, Joshua chapter 5. We've probably taught around this passage and alluded to it a lot because I really love it. This is one of those stories in the Old Testament that are one of my favorite. I really uh, just feel like there's a lot of parallels even to where we are uh, in this uh, modern day. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about lordship but really kind of lay it beside some of our personal decisions we have to make. A lot of uh, our daily activities, the things we walk through. Maybe the crossroads we come to and we think about things in, in a scenario where we just think we're making the decisions and sometimes we just think God has to either get on board or not with us. Maybe we think, God, will you approve or disapprove of what I'm doing? And I'm going to challenge you really to go back to the drawing board and allow God to be the one who builds the strategy for your life, who, who builds a framework and a plan for your life that we stop asking, God, will you be on my side or God, will you endorse what I'm doing but we start saying, God, what are you up to? What, what is it that I need to be involved in? And uh, what is it that really is going to bring you glory uh, in my life? So that that's really is a picture of lordship. Uh, in some of my seminary work, the last school I went to up in Southern in Louisville, uh, there was a debate in one of the classes, and it came out of a, an idea of salvation that I really don't hold to. There, there's some people, and in, in that room there was a couple preachers who actually believed in like a lordship salvation. In other words, it was a, a dichotomy, like a second salvation. You, you are saved, but then later on in your life, you make Jesus lord of your life. And while we may not say that, I, I've heard even growing up, and I may have even been guilty of saying it before, that you know we're born again or we got saved at this, this age, and Jesus was my savior. But then later on in life, you know, when I really committed to him, he became lord of my life. And I understand what we mean by that, if anybody in here maybe has even said that before. But I want to challenge you not to use that, that way of talking, because here's the deal. That really is not a clear picture of salvation. When we come to Christ, we come to Christ completely. Either we come to Him completely or we don't come to Him at all. Because with Jesus, it's not like a halfway salvation. You can't, you can't just get the plane ticket to heaven, right? And, and just say, okay, thank you, that I, I'm gonna be, I'm, I want the salvation part. But I don't really want the lordship part. See, salvation really is lordship. It's us acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of all. And, and, and salvation is us saying, you know what? I am personally acknowledging, Jesus, that you're Lord of me now. You're Lord of my life. And so salvation is about surrendering. It's about laying down our life, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. So it's, it's dying to sin and self. Even if you just think about the born again the term born again. We, we believe as evangelical Christians that when you're saved, you're born again. Well, the reason we believe that is Scripture teaches that we're born again. And, and if you're born again, you have died. You literally died to your old life. And so it, it's, it's, there's no way we can uh, kind of live in both lands. We have to either be an unbeliever who does not follow Jesus and who has not surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, or we're a follower of Jesus who does follow Jesus every moment of every day, and we, we have surrendered to Lordship. Does that mean we're never going to make mistakes? No, absolutely not. You're going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. But He is the Lord of our lives. We acknowledge that He is in charge. We are no longer uh, the author of our life. He is the one who we follow, and we submit completely to Him. Now, in the passage of Scripture, I ask you to turn to Joshua chapter 5. It's kind of the end of the story. And we're not going to go all the way into the, the walls of Jericho coming down. We've talked about that in a sermon not too long ago. But I want you to give you, give you a little bit of background again with uh, the Israelites. These Israelites that we see in Joshua chapter 5 and even Joshua chapter 3 are the children of the Israelites who disobeyed God. 
uh, and they crossed the Red Sea, if you remember the, the stories in the Old Testament. They crossed the Red Sea, and then they did not take the land. And when they did not take the land, they were punished, and they were sent into the wilderness wanderings for a time. Well, none of those adults besides Joshua and Caleb were allowed to go into the Promised Land. And so Joshua and Caleb and all the kids now of those, uh, those Israelites are now crossing the Jordan River in chapter 3. And, uh, and so we see the crossing of the Jordan, and it, re it reminds these people, no doubt, that the same God who allowed uh, the Israelites to cross the Red Sea is the same God who now is allowing them to cross the Jordan River. And again, it ought to remind us today that this is the same God we serve. We don't serve a different God. He's not changed. God doesn't change. Jesus says he is the same yesterday, today, today. And forever, and so we, we worship the same God, and so the same is true of us today. He is exactly where He has always been. He's waiting on me to surrender. He's waiting on you to surrender. And that's why lordship is so important, because it is an issue. My, even my issue of, of really living a victorious Christian life, being all I can be for God, is directly tied to my acknowledgement of His lordship. You see, the, the more I surrender to God, the more God's going to use me. The more that I yield myself to Him, the more that He's going to shine through me. And the same is true of every single one of us. And so, uh, man, it's such an important discussion as we move forward. So God's people crossed the Red Sea, but refused to claim the Promised Land. And as a result, they were punished in the wilderness. And a generation now has died, but Joshua and Caleb believed, and they were re rewarded. Now we see Joshua here in in Joshua chapter 5, it's after he's crossed the Jordan. They're getting ready. They're in the shadow of Jericho. All right, The walls are standing. And I, I have to imagine that Joshua is, is kind of excited. He's a little pumped about this because this is his wheelhouse. This is, this is, man, this is his strike zone. This is exactly what Joshua was made to do. He was made to fight. He's a warrior. I mean, he's created with this leadership ability to take an army in a military action and conquer another people. And so God has wired him this way. He's made him this way. But yet in the shadow of Jericho, we see that he's going to be confronted with a different plan. And, uh, and in the midst of this, it would have been really easy for Joshua uh, to rebel against God. To say, man, I don't like that plan. I've got my own strategy. Don't you know who I am? I'm Joshua. I'm the one who's leading this army. But we see in Joshua chapter 5, look in verse 13 and begin to read with me, and you'll see that Joshua really did have to be confronted with the question, who's really in charge? And man, the question I want us to ask, the question I want to ask myself, and I feel like everyone in here needs to ask themselves, who's really in charge of your life? That's the key question today. Who is Lord of your life? Is it God or is it you? I mean, is Jesus really sitting on the throne, or are you sitting on the throne of your own life? Look at verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? In verse 14, he says, Neither, he replied, but a commander of the Lord's army I have now come. As a commander of the Lord's army I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The Lord commanded, the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So this passage of Scripture where we're, we're looking today is a passage where the commander of the Lord's army, uh, which if someone were to say, well, who is this? This is a pre-incarnate Jesus. This is a pre-incarnate Christ. This is the Son of God prior to Bethlehem. And you may say, well, what, 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 am, what are you talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, there's Christophanies. There's appearances of the Christ, even before he was born in Bethlehem, we know even in the beginning uh, that uh, God was. And when God was, the Trinity was present. And so we know, even in his statement, let us make man in our image. So the Son of God is eternal. He was born in Bethlehem as a human being, but Philippians 2 even drives home again the doctrinal fact, the reality that, that the Son of God has never been uh, known a beginning, that Jesus was, that the Son of God was and is and is to come. He is eternal. So this is an, exi this is a, an example of, of uh, Christ in the Old Testament. And so we see here in verse 13 
uh, the first point that we need to see that just kind of lays it all out as a foundation. His lordship demands that we surrender our control. Everything else is built on this whole idea that lordship depends on us surrendering. We can't say that Jesus is Lord of our lives if we haven't surrendered to him. And, and even, again, at salvation, that is surrender. When we come to Christ at salvation, we have surrendered to him. We've decided, I'm choosing life with you instead of life without you. And we can't choose life with us in the back seat. We choose life with him in the driver's seat. God doesn't take back seat to anyone. And that's, that's the issue, is that we surrender our control. And man, we're control freaks, right? I mean, we all have to admit that we want to be in charge. We want to be in control. We don't like it when someone else takes the control of our lives. But Jesus really doesn't give us the option. It is either we give him control or we don't. We often ask God the wrong question. In verse 13, uh, we see that, uh, that uh, Joshua says, Whose side are you on? I mean, who are you fighting for? Are you fighting for us or are you fighting for our enemies? And I think this season in particular, really, it's pretty relevant. And, uh, man, th and I don't expect, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people to, to uh, just really get excited about this. But I'm just going to tell you, uh, it's, been, it's never been more obvious um, than now that uh, people try to manipulate God. They try to manipulate Scripture. They try to twist things and turn things in our culture to try to at least make it appear that God is on their side. You know what I'm talking about? There, there are people all around, there are groups all around our country who uh, try very, diff very hard to, to get, get uh, everybody to believe that God is for them and that God is for their side and that anybody that's a Christian needs to get on that side. And I'm just going to tell you again, that, that's a dangerous thing. There are pastors who, um, and, and I would even say there's people who would, would be critical and say, you know what, pastors need to speak out and even endorse a political candidate. I had, a, I had a president of a former college I went to who endorsed a candidate. And regardless if I'm going to vote for that person or not, it upset me that they endorsed a candidate. You may say, well, why, preacher? Because I think any time a, a Christian leader like that endorses a candidate, then what it does is it, it, it really does put pressure in a lot of ways on the people who they're leading. But I would even say this. It is me speaking for God, and it's me saying to everyone else that I think God is on their side. You may not see it that way, but here's what I want you to see. I, I feel like I'm going to be responsible for all the things I say and all the things I even lead you and try to lead you to do. But here's what I know. This is one of those political cycles. The smartest pastors need to stay quiet. Amen? <laughs> hey, thank you. I agree. I agree. Uh, but here's why. Uh, the issues are important, and I think we all should speak to the issues. And Christians ought not to be ashamed or afraid. There's not any kind of fear. But I'll be honest. I mean, just being honest before the Lord, I, I, I really do not believe that anyone has some kind of like divine right to say that person is God's person for our country. And I want you to be careful, really, as a follower of Jesus, be careful trying to say those kinds of things. Because here's an example of a time, the question is not, the question is not, is God on their side? The question is, is our nation on God's side anymore? You see, it's not of, is God on Wayne's side? It's a, is Wayne on God's side? Are we surrendering to him the way we should? Is my family on God's side? It's not a question of, is God on my family's side? It's a question of, is my family surrendered to his lordship? See, the problems we have in this country... We could, we could blame all day long a political party or a person. You know what the problem is? We're, we've left God, guys. We've left God. And, and we're not surrendering or acknowledging his lordship over us. The church, honestly, most churches in North America would not recognize Jesus Christ if he walked in the door. That is the problem with our nation. That is the problem with our nation. Now, we could spell it out in different ways, and we could, we could definitely have opinions. And listen, I, I promise you, there's one thing I have. It's a lot of opinions. Amen? I really do. And so I understand, and I, I understand passion and, uh, and, and a desire to persuade people to our side. But before the Lord, a Christian's responsibility is to point people to Jesus Christ. And we should not do anything in this political season 
We should not do anything in this political season that would cause half of America not to listen to us November 9th. Y'all all right? It's the truth. It's the truth. We should bring people toward the cross. We should not push them away. So, man, let's be faithful as followers of Jesus to make much of Jesus. He is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Heaven and earth will pass away. Even, even this nation will pass away one day, but His Word will not pass away. Jesus Christ will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's not a question of whose side are you on. Look, God makes it very clear. He's Lord. He's Lord. We're not in charge. He is. We're not in charge of our lives individually. We're not in charge of our families. We're not in charge of our nation. God ultimately is. He is Lord. But then secondly, you see, God doesn't negotiate. God doesn't negotiate with us. It's not like we come to God and say, you know, Lord, I really, I really like, here's my strategy. Here's my plan. And this is the way we act like our life is. God, here's my plan for my life. You know, I want to go to this college. I want to go to this issue. By the time I'm 45, I want to, I want to retire. Here's what, and when I retire, I want to go to this place. And I, you know, I've got it all mapped out. Here's my plans for my life. And we take that to God and we say, God, would you approve this? You know, yes or no? Is this a good plan? And, and, and that is an errant approach to lordship. See, we come to God not with the plans already drawn. We come to God and we hand him the pen. We hand him the authority and the opportunity to tell us everything that we are to do, everything that we are to become. See, it's not our prerogative to try to manipulate the process of God's plan for our life. We are to come to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to be? But see, even in, in, our, in our lives, many times we draw a line in the sand. We say, God, I'll do everything for you. I'll follow you anywhere as long as it's not there, you know? Uh, Lord, I, I want to serve you with all of my heart as long as it's not to those people, you know? I'll do anything as long as it doesn't make me uncomfortable. And, and again, this is, this is so extra-biblical. This idea of, of uh, really compartmentalizing our, our lives and e even, even further, partial obedience. Man, you can mark this down. I've heard it said. It's not original with me for sure. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. And we can sing every song about lordship we want to. We can sing I surrender all and halfway obey God. And if we halfway obey God, we completely disobey him. Because lordship is an acknowledgement that he is in charge. And, and, and he is the one who calls the shots. And, and my, my job is to surrender to him. I, I don't have an opportunity to negotiate with God. He only makes one deal. Here's the deal. Follow me. Jesus makes one deal, and that is follow me. Here's the key. Christians experience real victory as they follow in obedience. And that's what we see eventually in chapter 6. You know the story of how they obey. The instructions were strange. I think that's how we even talked about it in the message uh, previously, of how odd the instructions were to march around this many times and to, to blow the trumpets and to do all this. But here's the deal. All of God's work was dependent on their obedience. You know, he had said, if you do this, your prom the promises will be realized. If you follow my instructions, if you obey. And so if they had not obeyed, I don't believe the, the walls would have fallen. And in our own lives, we, we wonder, you know, why isn't God working in our lives? Why, why is God not showing up in a way that he used to? Or, or maybe why don't we look in, in the Old Testament and see something that's similar to what we experience? And some people would come up with other explanations. I just believe we're not as obedient. We, we don't have the same faith many times. We don't yield our lives to him completely. We like to give him our Sundays, but not our Mondays, you know? We like to give him this part of us, but not that part of us. We like to, to keep a box of things that we have hidden from him. Uh, we might, you know, like to surrender this, but not that. Uh, we, we say we love him and we will follow him anywhere, but our schedules look more like we love us than we love him. You see, I, I think that if we're honest with ourselves... We really haven't grasped this issue of lordship in a way that God would have us to grasp it. This is the question we should be asking. Am I for God or am I against God? Am I for God? Am I on God's side? Not am I on this side or that side. Am I on God's side? Am I God's man? Are you God's woman? Are, are you standing where he wants you to stand? Not where everyone else expects you to stand. Not where everyone else is telling you you should stand. But are you standing with God? We see thirdly, victory will not come on the side God is on 
Instead, victory will come to those who are on God's side. It's just that simple. Verse 14 lays it out clearly. It says, I'm on neither. <laughs> neither, he replied. I'm not on your side and I'm not on the other side. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. And so he says, I'm not choosing a side. Your job is to choose my side, God said. So instead, victory will come to those who are on God's side. We must most often attempt to find what we can do for God, but we should seek to discover what God will do through us. God, what are you doing? God, where are you working? And Lord, will you work through me? It's not about me trying to impress you. It's not about me trying to, to do enough to earn your love. But Lord, I want to empty myself and allow you to indwell me and you to use me for your glory. So our obedience initiates the fulfillment of God's promises. See, so many times we sit back and we say, God, why aren't you blessing me the way you're blessing so-and-so? God, why aren't you using me the way you're using so-and-so? And we never stop to think it may be just a direct result of our lack of obedience. It may just be that we're not doing everything he's called us to do. We're not surrendering every part of our life. There's something we're holding back from him. There's something we're keeping from him. And we do this in some, some crazy mixed up way. We do it in selfish way. But here's the deal. After we surrender ourselves to God, man, God's promises are so much better than what we would have had otherwise. So when we surrender to him... He does open up the windows of heaven, not necessarily uh, materialistically or financially, but he does bless us. He blesses us in ways that we can't even measure. Fourth and final, I want you to see that our walls will only fall as our praises rise. The only way that we're ever going to see victory in our lives is when we are willing to lay down our lives for him in worship. And so, it's, and again, it's not, we're not just talking about a Sunday morning worship. We're literally talking about an every day of our life worship. Uh, so, that, so that there's not just this compartmentalized dichotomy of spirit and social action. You see, again, in, in the church, there, there's this extreme. Some people think, well, you know what, I, I have this view personally, but I don't want to impose my view on everyone else. Listen, that, that, that's a tragedy, because here's the reality— God's word is God's word, and he, he is Lord of our lives, and, and he's Lord of our lives seven days a week. So there's not a, an opportunity for us to say, well, you know, I'm going to hold this position personally, but I'm not going to necessarily hold it publicly. You see, Christians don't have that luxury, again, because it's not our decision to make. Ultimately, when God has a plan, it's our plan. We are on his side. We don't, again have the luxury of manipulating the process. We don't have the, the luxury of, of trying to, to negotiate with God and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this stand when it's easy. But when it gets difficult, I'm not going to take this stand. And see, that's what we have to do, especially in, in such a, a crazy political... I, I, this is not a political message, but it so applies right now. See, it's, it's so easy for us to get hung up in our own issues and we can and it, and it be an agenda for us and we ignore a lot of other things about someone or, or some group, and we just dive into this one issue or these two issues, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Man, just back up with God, all right? Just seek His purpose and His will. Look at the entire picture, and you make the decision God is leading you to make. Not a decision that a pastor or, or a, a politician tells you to make. And here's the deal. Listen, just so you know how balanced this is, you can find pastors on both sides, all right? I promise you. Uh, there are pastors, well-known pastors, on both sides of every issue. Uh, you can always find somebody who will give you a spiritual answer that will support your argument. I Trust me, all right? I promise you. And that shows you what a terrible day we live in. It's a day where people don't really care as much about what Scripture truly says. They just try to manipulate and find a proof text to prove their point. We shouldn't start with our point, right? We shouldn't start with our opinions, we should start with pleasing God. We should start with falling on our face. Look, Joshua didn't try to manipulate the situation. Joshua didn't try to fix it. Joshua recognized that the answer was standing in front of him. The commander of the Lord's army was the only one that could make the walls fall in Jericho. And see, again, if we're trusting in, in, in a party, if we're trusting in, in a person, if we're trusting in a country, to be honest with you, we're going to fail. We're going to be disappointed. We need to trust in Jesus Christ. Our church, our city, our, our state, our nation needs to come back to the Lord. 
Because he's still Lord. He's Lord. Regardless if we acknowledge him as Lord or not, he is the Lord of all. And there will be a day where every knee will bow, right? Philippians 2. Every knee is going to bow. Not only in the United States. Every knee is going to bow in the world. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So here's the question. Will we wait until we're forced to acknowledge his lordship? Or we, will we willingly acknowledge his lordship today? He is Lord. The question is, are we acknowledging him as Lord of our lives? Are we surrendered, truly surrendered? I'm not talking about singing a song. I'm talking about living a life of surrender. Are we really surrendered to him? Does he have control of our opinions? Does he have control of our mouth? as we talk about those opinions. And I'm going to challenge you again. Man, I didn't plan on putting it this, this tough. But listen, there should be nothing we say today about any issue, politics or anything else. There should be nothing we say today that causes us to lose our voice to a lost person tomorrow who may otherwise hear about the cross and let it be said of us that the loudest message we preach and teach is not vote for this person or these people, but the loudest message people hear us teach and preach is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the message of the church. That must be. That must be the message of the church. Now, are there issues? Absolutely, there's issues we've got to speak to. But man, let's not push people away during a, a contentious, confusing chaotic political season let's make much of jesus because listen <laughs> he's our only hope he's our only hope he or she neither one of them is going to save the world amen i'm just telling you jesus is our only hope so the lord could have said joshua get your sword ready go and fight make me proud man do what I've made you to do. Go out there and fight. Now, were there other times later where Joshua fought? Absolutely. Were there days where God maximized his ability in defeating enemies with the sword? Absolutely. But on this day, the fight was not won with the sword. The fight was won with Joshua's face on the ground. The fight was won when Joshua acknowledged the lordship of Christ. So today... Man, we've got to fight, there's no doubt. There's a war for the souls of men that's being waged on not just this country, but our world. But let me tell you, the answer is in Christ alone. The answer is in Jesus. So look, you may have swords in your hands. I'm, put them down. Put them down. He may ask you to pick them back up, all right? But right now, worship Him. Worship Him. Acknowledge that He is Lord, that He can be trusted with the chaos of this day, that He can be trusted with the outcome of whatever happens. Andy Stanley recently, and he says some stuff I don't agree with, I'll be honest, but uh, he said recently, he had a, had a message where he, it was, uh, don't scare the kids. I don't know if you saw that clip. Man, it was a powerful word. If you just type Google or, or uh, go on YouTube and don't scare the kids, Andy Stanley would come up. And it speaks directly to this. Sometimes we get so distracted that we, uh, we, get, we get hung up on, on the meaningless things that we overwhelm everybody around us and we get so confused to where uh, we start acting like we really don't think God's got this thing under control. That we, we really think that everything depends on us. That somehow we've got to make the right decision or else the world's going to end. Listen, Jesus does not need us. It's an opportunity that we have to be engaged and involved in this huge thing he calls the kingdom work. But at the end of the day, everything is going to depend on him. And, and no problem we're facing in our individual lives or as a nation is bigger than him. He is Lord of all. And he's capable. No matter what happens, look, he's capable of protecting and preserving his church. And we need to do everything we can to make much of Jesus in the midst of Every single circumstance. Have we become so wrapped up in the fight that we've neglected to worship Him? We will not win the victory as warriors. We will only win the victory as worshipers.
Joshua's battle was not won with the sword or with the spear. The walls of Jericho fell when people acknowledged the lordship, the lordship of God. So I pray today that we would acknowledge his lordship. He's in control. No matter what you're facing, look, I know, man, you, you guys in this room, there's people who are facing some tough stuff. I mean, you're, you're facing occupational tragedy and sh- struggle and crisis. you got family issues, financial problems. There is no telling. It's an endless list of things that we're all facing. And it will be real easy to get hung up and think this is your fight to win. you got to pick up the sword. you got to fix it. you got to do it. I want to challenge you to fall on your face before God and start with worship. Start with worship. Start with calling out to Him and saying, God, I can't. I know you can. No matter what else next steps are, no matter what you tell me to do tomorrow, I'm starting today by acknowledging you're in charge of my life. I'm going to forget the mistakes I've made. I'm going to forget the things that other people have done to me. And I want to acknowledge, today I start on ground floor of acknowledging that you are Lord of my life. I guarantee you that will be a wonderful place to start. And you'll see he will take control of your situation. I challenge you to do that. If you're here today and you've never been saved, man, you're the most important person in the room. And everybody in this room would shout and be excited and celebrate if you come to faith in Christ today. You may say, preacher, I don't even know what that looks like. I'm just going to challenge you to come. If you'll come down front, we'll have ministers who will be ready to tell you exactly how you can leave this place in victory knowing that you're saved and you have a relationship with Jesus. And so I pray that you'll do that this, uh, this afternoon. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you. And God, I, I know, wow, what a day we live in. It's so confusing. And I know uh, sometimes we, we get so passionate, even in our own walk, even in our own lives. There are things we want. There, there are points we want to make. And uh, God, we, we oftentimes errantly pull you to our side. We try to use you or manipulate you. God, help me. I pray you'd help us all really to just see it's not, it's not about you coming to our side, but it's about us acknowledging that we're on your side. You're Lord. God, we surrender. I pray this would be a true surrender, a time of yielding to you personally as we just acknowledge you are worth it. God, you are worth it. You're worthy of our surrender. We love you. God, I pray that you'd move us in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?